In this video, we're going to talk a little bit about meiosis or the big picture and what it does, and then kind of its impact about reproduction, and then the alternative to organisms that reproduce in methods that don't require meiosis. Now remember, meiosis starts with a diploid cell, and we'll go through and divide into two cells at this stage. It's hap each cell is haploid and go through and divide again so we're left with four haploid cells all with one allele per every single gene in the body. So meiosis just like we said we're reducing that half the number of chromosomes from diploid to haploid so for humans that would be going from 46 chromosomes to 23 chromosomes. So in the big picture, again, we're taking that haplo or the diploid number, the normal number, 46 chromosomes for females and 46 chromosomes for males. Those will both go through meiosis to go in half. We'll put the egg and the sperm together through the process of fertilization. And then fertilization will make a baby, so to speak, which is technically a zygote. When the egg and the sperm come together, that's obviously one cell with 46 chromosomes, or the diploid number. And that one cell will become two cells. The two cells will become four. The four cells will become eight, so on and so forth, until we start developing a head and a brain and eyes and arms and legs and a spine and all the things that make you, you now. One of the main values of meiosis is that it prevents chromosomal abnormalities. Remember, our normal body cells have 46 chromosomes in it. That's the diploid number. So if we had 46 chromosomes donated from mom and 46 chromosomes donated from dad, that would mean that our zygote would have 92 chromosomes in it. Well, that's not the normal number of 46. That's way more chromosomes. So that would obviously be a chromosomal abnormality. Unfortunately, the zygote usually has a fatal flaw in development with chromosomal abnormalities. So if there's a chromosomal abnormality, meaning a different number of chromosomes than this magical number of 46, the zygote doesn't develop. So what meiosis does is it takes that number of 46 and it halves everything. So mom would donate 23 chromosomes. Dad donates 23 chromosomes, so our zygote now has 46 chromosomes in it for the zygote. And the zygote's now happy, wonderful, and will develop, hopefully develop completely normally. So meiosis keeps the chromosome number the same from generation to generation. Mom has her chromosomes. Dad has his chromosomes. They'll go through the process of meiosis. So there's the chromosomes from mom. There's the chromosomes from dad. Fertilization happens, and now the offspring, or a zygote, has, a, has half of the chromosomes coming from mom, half of the chromosomes coming from dad. So it's a combination thereof. The offspring doesn't look exactly like mom and doesn't look exactly like dad in their characteristics. Another value of meiosis concerns with change over time. And we kind of alluded to that in our last slide in that meiosis introduces genetic variation in the population. Take a peek at the chromosomes here in blue in the gamete from dad and the chromosomes from the gamete from mom here that are illustrated in red. So here's our zygote or our offspring. When that offspring goes through meiosis, look at all the potential gametes that, the off that this offspring here can make. None of the, of the gametes have the exact same chromosomes as the gametes that dad made or the gametes that mom made. So there's a lot of different genetic variation in the population and even from generation to generation. The more variation in our population that we have, the more likely that our population will be able to survive any sort of thing that might happen, whether it be uh, change in climate, um, whatever prevent 
any competition issues, whatever the case may be. This also can explain the differences between mother and daughter. There are some similarities, obviously hair color is a similarity here, and you see some distinguishing characteristics in the face between mother and daughter here, but they're still not identical, even though that really is the mom of this particular woman. And then over here you have three brothers, very famous brothers, but three brothers. They both have the exact same biological mother and the exact same biological father. They have very similar characteristics, but no one brother looks exactly the same as the other brother. And all of these pictures are taken from roughly the same time. So the differences between mother and daughter here and all three brothers are all due to the different genetic combinations or the different arrangement in, uh, of chromosomes that we have, all the potential outcomes through the process of meiosis. So not everything in the world has meiosis and reproduces sexually. All the bacteria are going to reproduce asexually. Anytime you put an A in front of a word, it means opposite. So if there's sexual reproduction, that means there's a sperm and an egg involved in the process of meiosis. So if there's no sperm and egg involved, then it would be asexual reproduction. And the process that is the term for asexual reproduction is usually binary fission. Binary fission is what bacteria do, where they simply take their original cell, they make a copy of their DNA, and then they divide in half to make two new cells. They're exact copies of themselves. They have the exact same DNA, so therefore they have the exact same characteristics. In, to put this in uh, human terms, these two cells would be identical twins, so to speak. This is asexual reproduction. So they're identical daughter cells, they're exact copies, and they have the exact same genetic information. So what are the advantages of sexual reproduction? Well, we said that one was a big thing to do with creating variation in our population. So not everything, every person or every asexual reproducer is exactly the same. The disadvantages of sexual reproduction is the exact same. You're not, one individual is, doesn't, can't produce as much genes in the gene pool as other individuals such as asexual reproducers. Asexual reproducers are exact clones. We sometimes hear of people needing matches for transplants, um, whether you need a kidney transplant or a heart transplant or whatever the case may be. If, every, if you were produced asexually, it'd be very easy to find a match. If you have a sexual reproducer, you have all that genetic variation, which makes it much more difficult to find a match. So what are the advantages of asexual reproduction? Well, it'd be very similar to what we said here. You got a twin and you're, con you're contributing a lot of the same genes to your gene pool. It'd be easy to find a match, etc. So what are the disadvantages of asexual reproduction? Well, if there's a climate change, in the population that somehow wipes out a part of the population? Well, if it wipes out part of the population and that part won't be able to survive, then the whole population would be wiped out because everything is genetically the exact same. So there's definitely advantages and disadvantages to both sexual reproduction and asexual reproduction. There's one more thing that we need to talk about meiosis. Meiosis in males and females does differ just slightly. For every cell that enters meiosis for a male, so for every spermatocyte that goes through meiosis, four gametes will be made, and those four gametes will all develop into sperm cells. However, for every cell that enters meiosis for a female, 
only one gamete is going to be made that's going to develop into an egg. And three, what we call secondary polar bodies will be made. So in this picture, over here on this part, this is our standard operating procedure meiosis as we've always learned it. We have one spermatogonia or one spermatocyte that makes four gametes that will all develop into sperm. For an oogonia or an oocyte, it will go through and it will develop it after the first meiosis. Only one is going to be a secondary oocyte. And then we're also going to have a polar body. The polar body still divides and will make secondary polar bodies. This is also a secondary polar body. But these three secondary polar bodies will not develop into eggs. Will not develop into eggs. This will develop into, this gamete here is the only gametes that, that's made, and it will develop into an egg. So females, for every primary oocyte that it has, will only develop one egg, whereas the males, for every primary spermatocyte, it will, for every one here, it will develop four sperm cells. So why do we think that there is a difference between males and females? The simple answer is the sperm is basically just donating its DNA. The sperm doesn't have to do a whole heck of a lot other than deliver the DNA. Whereas the egg, because the sperm goes inside of the egg. So the egg has to ha ha provide all the nutrients for that growing and developing zygote until it can do it on its own and have, for us humans, have all the nutrients be delivered through the umbilical cord. Well, that umbilical cord has to be developed. So the egg has to con contain all of the different nutrients for that growing, developing zygote before the umbilical cord can be established and be maintained. Even though that, it, that it's different in terms of what's going to happen, we only have one egg for the female. These three secondary polar bodies are still genetically identical to the egg. It, from the standpoint of it still has one allele per gene and it's, they're all still haploid cells. So it's not like they got any more, the egg got any more or less DNA or chromosomes or chromatids or alleles. All that it did is this cell, this gamete that's going to develop into an egg, basically stole all the nutrients from the other cells so it can develop into an egg. And that is all she wrote for meiosis and reproduction. It's like this and like that and like this, Anna. It's like that and like this and like that, Anna. It's like this. So just chill to the next episode.